everyone hear me? Do I need to speak more slowly? No, okay, good. Just you, okay. Please um, give me a wave if you can't hear me. I've, I'm always being accused of um, talking too quietly or too quickly, so apologies in advance. Um, so thank you very much for um, coming to my talk today. Um, I think John Dixon asked me to do this talk about 18 months ago, um, so it's been a long time coming. Um, usually I give talks about the Doughty Group and the Doughty Archive, and I will be doing this today, but John has also asked me to focus on the Tewkesbury area, and particularly the expansion and decline of the Doughty Group in the area. So the first half of my talk will be looking at the general history of the Doughty Group and where it was placed, and then I'll try and do a little bit of um, explanation about what was happening in Tewkesbury um, using what I know from the archive. I'm also going to try and use a pointer and this thing. Um, so, can I just have a quick show of hands? I always do this at the beginning of a talk. Who here used to work for any of the Doughty companies? I said about half, didn't I? Uh, what about anyone whose family members used to? Amazing. Um, so that just shows how many people still have a real affinity and love for the Doughty Group history today, um, even though the group was sold off uh, 30 years ago. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about the history of the Doughty Group. Uh, it was one of the most prominent employers in Gloucestershire for much of the second two-thirds of the 20th century. I will be using the book you see on the left of the screen um, as an auto uh, which is George Doughty's autobiography, as the basis for this talk. Um, I will explain a little bit more about the book later, um, but I'll be using some quotes from it during the talk course of this evening. And I'll also be using some excerpts from the Doughty archive um, to provide a history of the Doughty group. So the George Doughty book you see on the left, I actually edited this back in 2020, seems like a long time ago now. Um, and we published the book in December of that year. And since then, I've been promoting it with talks, um, both to local groups such as this one and also industry focus groups such as the Royal Aeronautical Society, the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, etc. And a couple of years ago, I also spoke uh, about this book at the Gloucester History Festival, and I interviewed Sir George Doughty's son, who is local to here and provided the original manuscript to us at the Heritage Hub. Um, I was going to bring along some copies of the book to sell, but it's sold quite well, and I didn't know how many people already had it. So if you did want to buy a copy, I think there's a couple of bookshops in Tewkesbury selling it, so I will let them make the money from that. Um, but if you did want to have a look at it, I do have a hardback copy for you to leaf through if you'd like to. Um, so as I said, I will be focusing mainly on the, um, the people and the companies of the Ashchurch and Tewkesbury areas. Um, and at the end, I'll also explain just a little bit about how you can do your own research on the uh, particular Doughty companies and people that you're interested in. I'm also happy to take questions at the end and explain how you can do the research yourself. Um, so I used to work at the Heritage Hub, as um, Sam said, and most of the documentary information for the Doughty Group uh, of companies is at the hub, um, and most of the documents that I'll be using this evening are from there, and also from a website which I'll talk to you about at some point this evening as well. Uh, so that's me on the left. Um, that was at the height of trying to catalogue the Doughty archive. So you see the boxes on, I don't know, my left, I guess the right-hand side of the picture. There were 1,500 of those to go through, and I had two and a half years to do it. Um, and that's the state I was in about two years and three months into it. It was a posed photograph, by the way. Um, but yeah, there was just an awful lot of reboxing and sorting and packaging and numbering and trying to work out what was what and what was where to do. So that was the effect that the Doughty Archive had on me. Um, and yeah. Um, it was an enjoyable time, um, but it was very it was very busy, and I learned an awful lot about herit um, industrial heritage as well. Um, but what I really want to always say about me at the beginning of any talk on Doughty is that I 
know next to nothing about aircraft engineering. Um, I'm an archivist. I was employed to work on the Doughty project as an archivist, nothing more. I always claim, possibly as an excuse, that a prior fascination with the aviation industry would probably distract me from the job at hand. Now, I have become a lot more familiar with the industry, and I've also done weird things such as go on the committee of the Royal Aeronautical Society um, and be invited to um, unveil a plaque at the Institute of Mechanical Engineers in Bromsgrove, which I was not expecting to be doing five years ago. Um, but I tend to pass any technical queries that people have to colleagues in the industry who actually know what they're talking about. So I can talk to you about the organisation of the Doughty Group. I cannot really explain much about their products. I'm also not a historian, um, so sorry, guys, who think that I might be. Um, I do have an interest in history, mainly architectural and railway, um, but, yeah, I'm not a historian. I don't claim to be a researcher. I claim to be mainly uh, an organiser. And lastly, just because I want you all to hate me, um, I'm not local to Gloucestershire. Um, I'm not from the area. I don't know an awful lot about Tewkesbury um, or Ashchurch or anywhere else. Um, I am responsible for preserving and making accessible documents relating to the whole of the county. And again, I've learned a lot about the area since starting work at Gloucestershire Archives in 2017. Um, but I interpret the documents as part of my job. I decide what needs to be kept. I make sure they're preserved in the best way possible so that future generations can access them. These documents can be anything from 12th, 13th century Latin deeds, which I cannot read, by the way, um, to digital archives that were just created the other day. Um, Gloucestershire Archives, which I'm sure many of you know, is based at the Heritage Hub in the centre of Gloucester. They also look after photographs and audiovisual material, but not objects. So if you wanted to see any objects relating to anything, uh, go to a museum. And if you want to see objects relating to Doughty, generally go to the Jet Age Museum in Staverton. Um, and then also, I actually don't work at Gloucestershire Archives anymore. Um, so since John asked me to do this talk, um, as was said, I have left. Um, I now work for Wiltshire Council, so I would now work in Chippenham, but I still live in Gloucester. Um, so I still have a, a love for the local area. Um, so I'm still very happy to come along and talk about what I've been doing. Um, and really, Doughty took up an awful lot of my time while I was working in Gloucester. It's always nice to talk about it, and it's always nice to see people interested in it. So a little bit about the Doughty archive. Um, it was, until I catalogued it, the largest uncatalogued collection held at Gloucestershire Archives. Uh, that's Gloucestershire Archives there. The Gloucestershire Heritage Hub is what it's um, now known as. It is a kind of collection of lots of different heritage um, things. Um, it was transformed into the Gloucestershire Heritage Hub as part of a project called For the Record. And there were many partners from across the counties of Gloucestershire and South Gloucestershire including Saffron Landing Systems, whose Gloucestershire base is the old Doughty site between Gloucester and Cheltenham that used to be Doughty Rotol. And one of the projects that the transformation of the building hoped to achieve was the cataloguing of the business archive of the Doughty Group. So it had been stored in boxes like you see uh, in the picture on the left in the archive since 1998, but not really touched. No one knew, really knew what was there. It was so large that no one could really do anything to make sense of it without some external funding. So that came in the form of the funding for the transformation project, and it enabled the employment of me as the project archivist to work for two years on cataloguing the archive and also doing a lot of outreach with the local and wider Doughty community. This involved setting up a community heritage website, which is still going strong. Uh, we utilised volunteers to enhance and make more sense of the archive, and we also carried out oral history interviews with people who used to work for the Doughty Group, and we are still doing that now. So if anyone wants to be involved in that, please let me know. Although the project finished um, well, probably two and a half, three years ago, the website and the oral history interviews um, are always continuing. The many conversations that have been started by the project are always continuing. So, the, you know, the legacy is ongoing. And fortunately, I was employed on a temporary contract to catalogue the archive, but then shortly, a uh, short while into it, I was made permanent, which meant that when the project officially ended, I was still working at Gloucestershire Archives and I was able to stick around and uh, help with a lot of the continuing outreach with the community. So that was really nice. 
But as I'm showing today, we're still able to continue these conversations. I've left Gloucestershire Archives. I still want to come and talk to Doughty communities and local communities about the Doughty group and about what they were doing because it's, it was just such an important part of Gloucestershire um, for so many decades. And there's a lot of momentum still involved with the project and it's a really exciting project to be involved with. Right, on to the history of Doughty. So, as I said, it's a huge collection. It's taken a great deal of time to make sense of the collection. Um, the, the archive is a business archive. There's very little on the Doughty family, um, so it's been really good to work on the autobiography of Sir George Doughty and find out a bit more about him uh, as a person. And obviously it's really easy to do that because he wrote it himself not long before he died in 1975, which means that we can understand him and his company a lot more as a result. The archive contains a lot of information that can go alongside the book and vice versa. Um, as business archives go, it's quite standard but massive. So it contains most of the basic administrative records of the business, uh, legal documents, minutes, accounts, um, many, many, many correspondence files, patents, uh, legal documents, um, photographs of various pieces of equipment, uh, apprentice records, thousands and thousands of them, lots of negatives of Doughty products, photo albums, um, lots of site plans, some of which I'll be showing you later, and also lots of records of other companies that were owned by or merged with the Doughty Group across the decades. And these records all help us understand the group's history. This was from a small muse loft in the middle of Cheltenham in the 1930s, shown on the left, to, which was employing two people, to a multinational company employing thousands of people in the aviation industry, but also in mining, information technology, communications, maritime, and many other things. So the picture on the left is Lansdowne Terrace Lane in Cheltenham. At number 10, George Doughty started his first Doughty factory, such as it was. He rented it when he handed in his notice at the Gloucester Aircraft Company, and this was to manufacture internally sprung wheels for the Kawasaki Company, who had responded to an advert he put in aircraft engineering in May 1931. George had been working on various inventions since he started working as an engineer in the 1920s. Due to financial issues, it was a typical startup company, he had to manufacture the wheels for the Kawasaki company himself, and he rented 10 Lansdowne Terrace Lane to do so. He achieved this with just two employees, both also colleagues from the Gloucester Aircraft Company. Of his first order, he wrote in his memoir, the only equipment I had was a workbench with a hand-operated pillar purchased for £3.15 shillings and a piece of plate glass to serve as a surface table. I worked night and day making production drawings, ordering materials and placing orders for the machine fittings. I employed two men who worked in the evenings assembling the wheels and they agreed to be paid when I was paid. Uh, somehow he completed the order on time and on budget. I think that's what councils tell you nowadays, don't they? On time and on budget. And this was the start of an impressive career in the aviation industry and beyond. These two pictures show an early Doughty product, um, an, advertise, an advertisement for the Gloucester, and a lovely photo of the very small early workshop at 10 Lansdowne Terrace Lane. That's the, uh, obviously the interior. Um, I did a slightly different version of this talk a year or so ago, and it was discovered as part of that that the plaque that I showed you on a previous slide is actually not on the correct house. Um, so if you go to Cheltenham and look for the plaque that says here is where George Doughty started his company, um, it's on a very similar looking workshop a couple of doors down, um, and they're currently trying to get it moved. Um, I think that was done in the 1980s, and unfortunately they just used the number um, and didn't realise that the numbers might change. But anyway, it's the right road, I suppose. Um, but that's the interior. Obviously, we know that's definitely the interior. And that's George Doughty's employees working on some of the early components. To the Kawasaki order, George Doughty had managed to produce some shock absorber struts. And he describes the manufacturer by one of his first employees, who was called Joe Balstead. And he writes... The parts for these struts were machined on a foot-operated lathe by a Mr. Balstead, who was to be one of my first employees in the cellar of his house. 
It is difficult to understand how these units ever came to be flown in, for they were not covered by Aeronautical Inspection Department release notes. In fact, I probably did not know such notes existed, and apparently nobody cared. Those were happy days. So this is a, a good blue plaque. This is on the right house. Um, this is the blue plaque that is attached to the wall of the house that George Doughty was born in, and he was born in Pershaw. And you'll notice, if you can read it from the back, that it's not just George who's remembered on this plaque, but also his father, who is described here as a chemist and pioneer of photography. So inventing and trying new things seem to be in George's DNA. His parents, William and Laura Doughty, lived in Pershaw, which is uh, obviously where this plaque is, and George was born on the 27th of April, 1901. He was the youngest of a family of seven, alongside his twin, Edward, who was almost identical to him and who did a lot of work for him when he was starting out his business. He regularly refers to his brother in his memoirs, who sadly, unfortunately, died in a car accident in 1945. The loss of his twin affected George greatly for the next 30 years, and from his book, it's clear that he really, really missed him. There was similarity in looks between the two brothers, which allowed them to play practical jokes in school, but that's really where it ended. Edward Doughty was a designer, and he was very creative. I suppose you could say George was as well. But when George started his career in engineering, he was creating brochures for his brother's products and also printed them, so they definitely helped each other out. And George talks about his brother's death in his book. He writes, On January the 22nd, 1945, a great tragedy occurred. We were both travelling to London by car with Sir Roy Fedden, Dick Spires, our chief service engineer, and my chauffeur Oliver, when some miles before Oxford we were struck sideways by a heavy army lorry out of control. It hit our car sideways, pushing it off the road and down an embankment. My twin brother, sitting on the outside, took the full force of the impact. Edward was taken straight to the Oxford infirmary, and George, luckily, was able to go home, but unfortunately he couldn't return in time later that day to see his brother alive. And he writes later, The loss of my identical twin was a most terrible shock. We had grown up together, we thought alike, we spoke alike, and had the same characteristics and mannerisms. Our lives were uncannily similar. His loss affected me greatly, and after 30 years, his memory is as strong as though he was still alive. Edward Doughty was a pianist and organist, and at one time he was the organist at Pershaw Abbey, where he was later buried. George installed an altar rail in the abbey in memory of his brother after his death, and we'll find out more about Pershaw later. Rather surprisingly, George Doughty was the only member of his immediate family to take an interest in engineering, even though his father was still a great pioneer in his own right. He was doing more with, with chemistry. And he was taking an interest in how things worked from a very early age. At the age of 11, he started experimenting with magnesium powder used by his father for his developments in photography. He set light to a bottle of powder and it exploded in his face, causing him to lose his right eye. This was a, a bit of a setback, but he didn't really mind. He continued to be very good at sports and, of course, extremely detailed engineering drawings. And no one would ever really have known that he had only one eye. And it's amazing to think that he was able to achieve so much precision with only one eye. A year later, his father died of a stroke, leaving his mother with eight children and not a huge amount of money. Some of George's siblings had already left home, but his older brother returned home to look after the family business, and George found a new father figure in his brother-in-law, who was sadly killed during the First World War. In the few years of this friendship, his brother-in-law, who was called Sidney, got him interested in engineering, giving him a model steam engine and a book called The Wonders of the Engineer. George writes in his book, Nowadays, a child's creative talents can be inhibited by the wealth of ready-made toys. But in my case, necessity was the mother of invention. I can remember how I contrived a miniature set of fairground gallopers operated by the steam engine, making use of an old umbrella frame. Making toys stimulated imagination and initiative and no doubt helped me in my inventiveness. Later, Sydney gave George a model aeroplane around the same time that he saw his first real-life plane, 
and this was born the love, lifelong love of aircraft. Although he was born not too far away, he moved around several times before coming to Cheltenham. And it was during this time that he began reading and writing papers for the Institute of Aeronautical Engineers and attempting to get his name recognised. In the Doughty archive, we have lots of copies of letters between him and various companies that show his intent to get his early patents registered and protected, and if possible, also get some products made and sold. He had to work very hard to get this achieved, and it would take several years before the first order that I have described um, before. He was still working at the Gloucestershire Aircraft Company when he set up his first company, the Aircraft Components Company, to try and get some business. And he was producing an illustrated brochure for this company for his products, along with his twin brother. The letters are the earliest documents held in the Doughty archive, apart from some 18th century deeds of land in Tewkesbury, which was later to become the site of a Doughty factory in Station Street. I'm sure you all know it. During George's teenage years, he worked at a factory in Worcester, but attended evening classes in mechanical engineering. Between 1918 and 1919, he developed his first proper interest in aircraft. His varied experience already in the aviation industry, which he had accumulated by that time, had made him critical of the way things were being done. And this was really what his, what his efforts were his whole life. He always wanted to improve, improve at the aircraft um, engineering world. His knowledge and his learning meant that by the time he got a job at AV Rowe in 1920, he was already regarded at the age of 19 as the undercarriage expert there, and he designed the undercarriage for the Avro Aldershot when he was just 19, and this is the plane here. And in the next few years, he was to make a name for himself really as an undercarriage expert. And when he got his job at the Gloucester Aircraft Company at the age of 23, he'd already written several papers for publications on how to improve various designs. The chairman of the Gloucester Aircraft Company was called Alfred Martin, and he would become instrumental in George's, George's success a few years later. In the years after his first proper order, orders began to arrive for parts slowly but surely. His name became known more widely, and he started employing more staff. He left Lansdowne Terrace and rented a place in Grosvenor Place South in Cheltenham, and in 1932, he changed his company name to Aircraft Components Limited. At this point, the annual turnover was £2,800, and there were five employees. A year later, the turnover was £5,000, and there were 11 employees. Within another two years, the company had expanded into its arguably most prolific premises. This is Alcourt in Cheltenham. And in 1940, it was renamed Doughty Equipment. This was the first time in the history of the company that George Doughty actually gave his own name to the business. By the time Doughty Group Limited was formed in 1954, the company employed over 13,000 people worldwide. Early records of the Aircraft Components Company and Doughty Equipment show the development of the company as well as employment of its staff. And this is shown in the archive holding engagement forms, salary books for personnel, legal documents relating to the formation of the company, business registration forms, sales ledgers, and order books. And this was all happening in Cheltenham, not far from here, from the first premises in Lansdowne Terrace in 1931, to the other place uh, in Grosvenor Place South, to Bath Street in Cheltenham, and finally to our court. Alcourt was purchased by George in 1935, so this was just four years after he started his first company. And he had the help here of Alfred Martin, who I've just mentioned, his former employer at the Gloucester Aircraft Company. Alfred Martin financed his company and enabled it to expand and move to larger premises. Initially, he wanted to build a new factory on the outskirts of Cheltenham, but was told he couldn't by the council. However, luck was on his side, Alcourt became available. It was a mansion with 80 acres of ground and eight cottages, with the present building constructed in 1834. It had been deemed too large for a private residence, so it was being sold cheaply, and the council agreed to Doughty's pursuit of it for a factory. He bought it for £6,500 in 1935. He turned the mansion house into offices. The outbuildings, stables, coach houses and garage became homes for workers and he built a huge factory 
at the back. Alfred Martin joined the board as chairman and George was able to get some much needed loans from banks, which enabled him to purchase the equipment that he needed to make his products on a much larger scale. The picture you see here is um, a really early um, signature book of the board of directors. So the signature at the top uh, is actually Alfred Martin um, and then George Doughty is the second one down. So that shows Martin's uh, responsibility there. Just two years later, another company arrived in the Cheltenham area. In 1937, Rolls-Royce and the Bristol Aeroplane Company formed a joint company called Rotol Airscrews. They manufactured propellers and landing gear for aircraft. 20 years later, this company was sold to the Doughty Group in what is arguably one of George Doughty's most important purchases. So George started his company eight years before the start of World War II. By the time the war started, the company had become well established and contracts had been awarded for lots of different aircraft, including military aircraft. However, when the war started, the requirements from Doughty's companies grew. Aircraft Components Limited began subcontracting and took on huge numbers of orders. And Doughty writes in his memoirs, the placing of contracts, the allocation of materials, the day-to-day -day liaison, the settling of innumerable queries, all these were controlled effectively from our court, such that at the end of the hostilities, we could claim the unique record that not a single aeroplane throughout the war years had ever been grounded for lack of a doughty spare. There are a few documents in the archive relating to the war. Uh, arguably the most interesting of these is a actually very small notebook, um, presumably written by Doughty himself, showing you can see the, the trend of the growing number of orders, sales and overheads from 1938 to about 1946. And you can see it tailing off and then it gradually starts up again as he started to sell things um, in his own right without needing the war. And after this, Doughty grew his companies both in industry and geographically. So he'd really been focused in Cheltenham and he continued to invent improvements to aircraft, but he also started repair work and he took on a factory in Ashchurch for the purpose of taking crushed aeroplanes and reconditioning them and putting parts back into the production line. The factory in Ashchurch was the first of many in the Ashchurch and Tewkesbury areas. Soon many others would be built and many thousands of people would be employed in the area for companies such as Doughty Mining Equipment, Doughty Seals and Doughty Electrics, which were all diversifying industries for George Doughty, but importantly, not always purchased companies by him. He was actually starting up these companies himself and, and moving into these industries. Uh, you can see the Ashchurch factory on the right, previously the Bird's Custard Powder factory. I understand it's very, very popular in the area. And Doughty actually employed many of the former employees, about 40 girls, who during the war had previously been making custard powder. And he writes in his autobiography, in order to give them some preliminary training, we persuaded the engineering department of Cheltenham Technical College to take them for a two weeks course. But no sooner had they arrived than we had a call from head of department saying these girls were wrecking the place and quite out of control and we must take them away. We only had two educational films to show them. And at the end of the fortnight, we could say that we had the only 40 girls in the world who could pack custard powder and read a micrometer. In 1944, just before the end of the war, Doughty took out a patent for the bonded seal, and this was to become one of his most successful products. Although Doughty seal started life in Cheltenham, it quickly moved to Ashchurch, where it stayed for many decades, and I think still has a presence today. People might know. Okay. Um, after the war, Doughty also grew his seals business to Malta, creating the company Malta Rubber, which at one point was the largest individual employer in Malta itself. During the war, Doughty's business and other businesses providing industrial help with the war effort were not allowed to make profits. Therefore, the company came out at the end of the war with no more capital than it had before the war started. However, Doughty was a shrewd businessman and he made sure that his company utilised the techniques and the knowledge that it had developed in the years before. And he writes, 
I well remember that then many aircraft companies went into abortive schemes on which they lost heavily, but surely, I thought, we had accumulated under the stress of war a kind of wealth which could, be not, which could not be taken away, a wealth of knowledge. It was then that we looked to see how we could profit from the techniques we had developed. We thought of ways sorry, in which this knowledge could be applied to other industries. So Doughty, knowing what he should be doing from the start, was then able to retain his workforce when many other companies lost theirs. And then he was able to start to profit from the huge amount of collective knowledge that he and his employees had gained through the war years. So I'm just going to spend a little bit of time talking about um, the, the Tewkesbury sites. Um, I'm sure many of you will know these better than me, so please forgive me. Um, I've got a few illustrative photographs of nothing really in particular and some site photos. Um, if you want me to go back to any of them, I'm very happy to. So after the war, the seals business was growing rapidly, developments in the mining and hydraulics industries, and these all made their preliminary homes in Ashchurch and Tewkesbury. Doughty mining equipment and Doughty auto units, which was later Doughty hydraulic units, were both set up in 1948. And the early version of Doughty Technical Developments, which was called Doughty Nucleonics, was situated in Station Street. There was also a company called Ashchurch Products, and the early Doughty Electrics Company was also based at Tewkesbury. Some of these companies, notably the seals and hydraulics ones, remained in the area for decades, becoming arguably part of the landscape. Others, such as Electrics, moved out of the area, but some of the earliest Doughty sites were in Tewkesbury. Number two unit was at Northway Lane in Ashchurch. Number three unit, again, Northway Lane, along with units 10 and 24, all belonging to Doughty Mining Equipment. Number four unit was Doughty Hydraulic Units and Doughty Electrics at Station Street. Number seven unit was Ganaways Lane Newtown, which was also home to Doughty Mining Equipment. And number nine unit was at Northway Lane, and this was the first home of Doughty Seals. I'm talking about all of these unit numbers only because Doughty was naming his units um, chronologi chronologically. So we had numbers 2, 3, 4, 7, and 9, and 10 were all in the Tewkesbury area. So these were all really early companies and really early sites that Doughty um, was setting up here. There is a deed concerning number 9 unit, dated 1960, which we can, where we can see um, Doughty Group Services, which was the, the service company, um, purchasing pieces and parcels of land um, in Northway Lane uh, in the borough of Tewkesbury, and it lists um, all of the, the acreage and the factory, so you can see um, how much land that the Doughty Group was buying. Uh, it's just a nice photograph I found of the Ashchurch Sports and Social Club. So Ashchurch and Tewkesbury were also utilised later in the Doughty Company's life. Um, obviously, the, unit, the units were numbered chronologically, so we know that a lot of the early ones were in the area. But we can also find number 29 unit at Tewkesbury Road in Ashchurch, and then 89 unit at the old depot in Chance Street, um, belonging to the servos and service division of Doughty Hydraulic Units. And then by 1991, Doughty Group Services had premises at Northway Lane. This was number 236 unit, so by this time there's, there'd been a lot more. So from site plans and site lists, possibly more so than from the actual business records of the various Doughty companies, we can see the really heavy presence of the Doughty Group in Ashchurch and Tewkesbury, continuing into the 1990s. However, by 1991, when we find these later units, unfortunately, a lot of the earlier ones would have been sold, but it still shows that there was a presence in the area. Um, as I said before, I really like railways, so I'm very excited to find these pictures of the, uh, the wagon buffer test facility at Ash Church. Just random, really. So this is where Doughty Hydraulic Units were testing the wagon retarders, and they had other sites elsewhere, but this was the main one in Ashchurch, obviously near the station. Um, I don't know why I ever thought you'd be able to see these words, 
But this is just a, a showing the lists of the Doughty sites. Um, and I, I mean, I can send these slides around if anyone wants to see the, the images later. But you can see a lot of the early unit numbers um, being in various um, premises around this area. That was in 1980. So this was after George Doughty died, um, but before a lot of the um, companies were sold off. So this is a site plan of number four unit. Um, this is Doughty hydraulic units, as I've said. Um, again, I don't expect anyone to be able to see um, exactly where this is, but we know that it's in Station Street. So anyone who knows Tewkesbury would, would know where this factory is. Um, and you can, what, what I love about these site plans is that it's showing not just the site of the factory, but the area around it as well. So you can really get a sense of how much room it was taking up and what was around it at the time. All of these site plans can be found on the Doughty Heritage website, so feel free to peruse at your leisure. Uh, this was number 89 unit in 1980, so this is the Chance Street factory. Uh, number 9 unit, um, this is Northway Lane. Uh, Tewkesbury Road in Ashchurch. This was Doughty Seals. This was Ganaways Lane. This was Downy, Doughty Mining Equipment. And this was in, so a, bit, a little bit earlier in the 1970s, they did a load of development plans where they showed, I think, where they were planning on building extensions to their factories. So these are really interesting, just from a few years earlier. Um, there might be a few differences between what was there in 1974 and 1975 and later in 1980. Uh, this is number 29 unit, by the way. This is uh, Tewkesbury Road, Doughty Seals again. Uh, number two unit, which was, um, as you can see, at Ash Church Station, sort of, Northway Lane. Numbers 3, 10, and 24, this was all Doughty mining equipment, um, again, around Northway Lane area. And then we move on to 1969. So the Doughty Electric site was the site that I've previously mentioned at the, the Bird's Custard Factory, which is how people tend to remember it. It's a much-loved icon of the area, and um, unfortunately, it lost a lot of its height, as I'm sure a lot of you know. The building was originally constructed by the Midland Railway, and it was a prominent part of the railway landscape just outside Ashchurch Station. The railway company also constructed some workers' cottages, which were subsumed into number two unit for Doughty as well. Doughty relied heavily on the railway's presence at Ashchurch, and some of its most iconic photographs from the area are of the old factory like this, with the railway and the wagon testing site nearby. The factory does still exist, I'm sure I'm telling you everything that you know, as part of the Northway Trading Estate. Um, as I said, it's several stories shorter due to this fire, and I think one after as well. Um, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. And this site would later become home to the Doughty Railway Preservation Society, which was founded in 1962 and used the sidings at Ashchurch for the storage and preservation of railway items. And this society moved to Toddington in the 1980s. Um, possibly someone here knows whether they moved because the site was sold, I couldn't work it out, or just because they'd grown. Um, feel free to let us know at the end. But in 1969, a fire broke out at the Doughty Electrics factory. It was the largest fire in the area in over 10 years. The fire destroyed the top floor, the roof, and half of the third floor. Over 100 firefighters from 12 neighbouring fire brigades attended the scene to tackle the blaze. They fought the blaze for over two and a half hours. But in the basement, over 100 tonnes of volatile polymer rubber was stored, and this was all destroyed. I managed to find some really nice quotes on the Doughty Heritage website, which had gathered some reminiscences from people who remember the blaze. Um, a couple of them I've, I've just noted down here. So um, one person says, I was working the night shift at Doughty Seals when the fire started. You could see the glow from the flames showing in the sky out by Gotherington. We on our coach thought it was Ashchurch Camp. We got onto the Ashchurch Tewsbury Road and got caught up in the traffic. When we finally arrived at Doughty Seals, we got sent back home. The fire brigade were, wor were worried about the old custard factory catching a light. 
Another person says, I was involved in going in to salvage whatever possible from the stationery stores, which was located in the building at that time. We always called the building the custard factory, as that, it was, that was what it was previous to Doughty. Interesting, a lot of the people who remember the blaze call it the custard factory, and that was what was important to them, was the fact that the custard factory was burning down. That's what I take from it anyway. And of course, this is expansion and decline. So at the end of the 1980s, the mining division, notably Doughty Mining Equipment, which was one of the biggest presence, presences at um, Ash Church and Cheatsbury, was sold off. This was in 1987. Obviously, this led to a lot of distress and anxiety within the factories in the area. So much rode on this for so many employees. Sorry. The division was one of a few that was sold off following a management buyout in the late 1980s. In 1995, which was after the rest of the Doughty Group had been sold, the, the mining business was purchased by Joy International, having been owned by Dobson Park Industries since the late 1980s. The sale of the mining company started the rapid decline of the companies in the Dewsbury area, and within a few years, the Doughty name, although not always the products, was sadly obsolete in Dewsbury and Ashchurch. This is um, quite a sobering selection of photographs that I found on the Doughty Heritage website taken by a local photographer, LJ Reed, and he was also a Doughty employee in Ashchurch. And this shows the site of Doughty seals and Doughty mining equipment following the closure of the factories in 1987-1988. These photographs were taken in the early 90s, just before the sites were demolished, um, and there was construction of the new housing developments, which are now really them instead of the factories. Uh, this is a newspaper article um, showing people being worried, obviously, about the, the sale of the company and what would happen to their jobs in the area. But going back a little bit, there was um, Ash Church and, and Tewkesbury were used also to train apprentices. Um, so this is a lovely photograph of the Ash Church Apprentice Training School, and a lot of people um, have reminiscences about being an apprentice for the Doughty Group here and elsewhere. Um, a lot of them spent four years working for the Doughty Group and then moved on somewhere else, but a lot of them stayed in the company and in the area. Um, I don't unfortunately know much about this particular apprentice site um, from the archive, but it may well, somebody does. <laughs> Did you want to? Wow, there you go. So yeah. Oh. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yes, I was working for Doughty Mining as an electrician, and I actually put all those, uh, connected all those um, machines up in that factory in the apprentice. And the lad who was working with me was actually an apprentice that had come out of that apprentice workshop. And you just showed the picture of the fire at the uh, Custer factory. I was in standing in the maintenance shop on the night shift. Mm -hmm. Looking out the window, watching that fire actually in progress. Wow! Yeah. And a few years and a, and a few years later, I joined the fire service. Where that, was that? That that was actually that one was in the custard factory on the second floor. Oh, okay. In the old building, it started. It we put it in the old building, and when it finally uh, the apprentice section was uh, got rid of, we took it all out. Oh, thank you very much. I did not know any of that, so it's really useful. Isn't it? Uh, well, I, I sort of went, I went the apprentice section, apprentice training schools was started in, I would say, 57, 58. And it was in number 10 originally, and that's where I did six months. You're using these numbers. Is that? But that is the the old custard factory, yes. Thank you very much.
Um, another version of my talk actually looks a lot more at the apprentices um, in the Doughty group because it was so important and we've also got a lot of the files still and um, there's a massive massive deal for the company and for people working in the company so um, yeah I didn't really have time to talk about that today unfortunately but I thought this picture was lovely. Um, uh, as long as it's about themselves yeah yeah um, data protection means that you can't access any file that's not yours. Um, not that they tend to say an awful lot about, you know, how good you were as a worker, but yeah, um, yeah, it's possible. Um, so I just want to spend the last couple of minutes of this talk just looking back at Sir George Doughty and how he was received and his praise for the work that he did for industry and engineering in general. So he was recognised within uh, Cheltenham and Tewkesbury and nationally for his work. In 1954, he was made an honorary freeman of the boroughs of both Cheltenham and Tewkesbury. In 1956, he was honoured with a knighthood, which he was delighted with, but actually wasn't for services to industry. Um, it was actually for services to the disabled, um, because he was a big advocate of employing um, disabled people and into like getting them um, re-employed into his factories. In 1955, he was awarded the gold medal for outstanding achievements in the design and development of aircraft equipment by the Royal Aeronautical Society. And he was also president of both the Gloucester and Cheltenham branch and the society as a whole at various different times. So I just want to finish this talk with a quote from his own foreword to his book. He writes, I started my engineering business in 1930 with just 50 pounds to my name. Many friends said I was crazy in throwing up a safe job as a draftsman, earning five pounds a week. But had I possessed 5,000 pounds then, the struggle that awaited me would have been the same. The years that followed were those of the depression and great unemployment. My lack of money forced me to improvise, to do without and to operate with the greatest economy. Looking back at this distance, I feel it is no real hardship to be short of cash when starting an independent career provided you have the stamina to withstand difficult and rigorous times. In his autobiography, he reminds us time and time again that his perseverance was key to his success. He was a relentless businessman, and whilst he obviously did do well out of his business, what I always take from his book and his work was the desire to improve, to invent new things, to improve industry, to diversify, and never assume that something was perfect. And this allowed him to become one of the largest employers in the Cheltenham and Tewkesbury areas. His legacy is everywhere. Most people in the area either worked for Doughty Group companies or know someone who did. And his work is still being honoured by companies such as Safran, Doughty Propellers and Trelleborg, which is the SEALs company in Tewkesbury. And many of his employees who worked for the Doughty Group companies still work for those successor companies now, 30 years after the sale of the Doughty Group. <laughs>